Today we're going to look at adjusting the compound and the cross slide uh, as they come from the factory. They're sometimes uh, not optimal and uh, they're actually one of the most important adjustments you can make on the mini lathe. If you have them adjusted properly you should get pretty smooth and even movement in and out. Uh, but if you have them adjusted improperly you may feel a lot of variation as you turn the hand wheels. Uh, they may be stiff. This one's a little stiff right now. Or you may feel as you turn around the circle that it's tighter in some spots and looser in other spots. Uh, also there can be a certain amount of play in here. In this one I've uh, intentionally introduced some play so I could demonstrate that. But if you take the tool post and wiggle it, if you see any movement of the whole assembly here, uh, that can lead to trouble. It can cause your tool to dig in uh, as it starts to cut that flex in there will cause the tool to drop down suddenly and uh, at least you'll get a bad case of chatter which will give you kind of a whining or groaning sound and typically leaves some uh, patterned tool marks on the surface of your work. Uh, but in a worst case it'll gouge your work and uh, take a chunk out of it which you don't want or possibly even uh, if you're using kind of a thin tool like a cutoff tool that may even break the tip off of your cutting tool. So uh, for all those reasons, you, you really want to uh, understand how these adjustments work and it's uh, important that you learn how to make the adjustments because if you, get, it will, if you don't have them right, it will really decrease your enjoyment of operating your mini lathe, uh, whereas if they are properly adjusted, for the most part you won't think about them, but uh, they should operate smoothly and without, with minimal chatter. It's pretty hard to eliminate it altogether. Now you're probably all aware that they're, the mini lathes, the 7 inch mini lathes come in a variety of lengths and starting with the shortest, the so called 7x10 which is only about this long and then the 7x12, 7x14 and this one which is the 7x16. Depending on which variation you have there could be quite a lot of uh, difference in the amount of room you have to work with here. This is a 7x16, I'm sorry a 7x14 so it uh, is pretty wide open compared to some of the smaller ones, but you will need some working room here. So I recommend that uh, before you start the procedure, go ahead and take your tailstock off. Your, uh, some of them have a self a little cookie lock lever here and others just use a nut, but whichever arrangement you have. Let me just set that out of the way here. So that uh, opens up quite a lot of room. And if you have one of the shorter lathes, uh, particularly the 7x10, you may even want to remove the chuck to give you a little bit of extra working room. And of course some of them have uh, a uh, chuck guard like this and others don't, but that probably shouldn't get in your way as long as you keep the carriage down uh, towards the middle or the right end. So uh, the first thing we want to do here is remove the um, tool post. So we'll take that off. And I like to uh, break it down to a more basic level to make these adjustments. You work with it at one level at a time and by that I mean do the cross slide and then do the compound. You sort of uh, work your way up and focus on one thing at a time which generally will help you get a better adjustment in the uh, final final analysis. So that's what we're going to do today and uh, in order to remove the compound as you probably are well aware you have to crank this back. Now here again these uh, give adjustments are a little too tight right now and because of that it makes this process of cranking back the uh, compound slide more difficult than it really should be. So I'm going to loosen these up a little bit because we're going to adjust them anyway so nothing to uh, be lost by changing them right now. So that loosened up a little bit. I put a little pressure here where the tool post normally is and that just keeps this thing from wobbling around so much as I try to remove it. Now by the time we're all done with the adjustments that we're going to make uh, this should be less of a problem. It's always a little bit of a problem but we can make it better by getting the gibbs properly adjusted so it, so it makes it easier when you do have to crank this thing back. It slides more smoothly. Now you probably know that the uh, there's two uh, hex head screw heads down under here, socket head cap screws. I'm just going to take my six millimeter, uh, I think it's a six millimeter T handle wrench, and now they're loosened up. I can swing it around 
and then we'll just uh, unscrew those all the way. You may need to keep a hand under here so that it doesn't drop off. But when they're fully loosened, you can lift that right off and keep the uh, we'll keep the bolts in there with that assembly and just set it aside for now. So now we're down to the uh, bare bones here of the cross slide, and uh, we have better access to that. We can also get a better feel for it uh, as we're making the adjustments. And probably most importantly of all, with the compound removed, we have much easier access to these screws here. And in particular, this one uh, closest to the front is very difficult to get to and manipulate if you have the compound in place. In case you're relatively new to the mini lathe and are not familiar with the uh, construction of the cross slide, I have a... Uh, Another one here, taken out of a different mini lathe. And this is, it happens to be a, from a real old one, actually all the way back in 1999. And uh, back then they used a brass nut here, but the newer ones now have a steel nut. That shouldn't make too much difference, but I wanted to show you the underside. So this is the top here, and the underside. And you can see there are three screws. These are the three screws that are along the right-hand side. And... Uh, but down inside here is a metal strip, and if you look at it, it has kind of a diamond-shaped cross-section. And uh, it sits along this edge of the dovetail. It's called a gib strip, G-I-B, or sometimes just a gib. But uh, if you look at it more carefully, you can see that it has three, in this case four, little indentations. Um, and those actually are there to keep this thing resting on the tips of the screws. Now this one, uh, being made way back in the early days of the mini lathe, had a little factory defect there, and it looks like they got one of the holes out of out of position, and so they drilled another one. But uh, normally you only see three there, and they sit uh, on the tips, as I mentioned, of these little adjusting screws. So effectively, this gib strip forms one side of the uh, dovetail that makes contact this is the, the female dovetail and it makes contact with the male dovetail and enables you to adjust this side in and out to control the amount of tightness or looseness uh, between the two parts of the dovetail. So that's good for a couple of reasons. One is it uh, lets you adjust it to make it more or less optimal and the second thing uh, over a period of years there's a little bit of wear on the surface of that gib strip and as that uh, wearing occurs you can make adjustments as necessary which will preserve the life and the accuracy of the lathe for many many years. In fact, uh, I'm quite sure that these lathes will last over 50 years if they're properly cared for. It's important to keep the dovetails uh, well lubricated and I like to use just uh, regular 5W30 or 5W40 or 10W30 motor oil, just ordinary uh, motor, motor oil like you can buy at a a gas station or at uh, Walmart or wherever wherever you buy oil for your car if you buy your own but if you don't you can just look in the automotive department at Walmart obviously and you'll find it there now in the early days of my website I used to uh, recommend using white lithium grease for this purpose but I found that it tends to get kind of gummy over time and it also tends to pick up uh, little pieces of chips of metal and so forth so now I no longer recommend white lithium grease for this application. It's good for other things, but uh, I think oil just works better here. So if your ways or your not your ways, but if your dovetails are not already well lubricated before you begin this procedure, uh, crank it all the way to the front and all the way to the back, and make sure you get a, a liberal coating of oil on there, because when we're making this adjustment procedure, we want to make sure that the uh, cross slide is able to move freely along the dovetails. So that's, uh, and you should maintain a thin uh, but fresh coat of oil on all of the moving surfaces on the mini lathe. That will uh, make it operate more smoothly and also help to prevent rust, which can also prevent it from operating smoothly. Okay, so I've got that done. Um, now the next step we're going to go ahead and loose. We need two two tools, and these are uh, two tools that don't necessarily come with the mini lathes. 
Uh, they come with a complete set of tools, but not all of them. They usually don't, don't include these two. And one of them is a 7mm open end wrench, and the other is a 2mm hex key. So you will need those two tools, and you'll have, want to have those in advance if you don't already have them. Now, one other thing, if your lathe is dirty or has a bunch of gunk on it, you may need to take a little brush and maybe some uh, uh, kerosene or WD-40 and squirt it in there and uh, clean out the uh, recess here in these set screws or else your hex key won't fit down in there properly. Or, if you want to, you can unscrew them all the way and drop them into a little uh, tray of uh, cleaning, out, cleaning solution, you know, either kerosene or WD-40 is a good choice. And now what we're going to do is take our, our little wrench here, our 7 millimeter wrench, and loosen up this lock nut. And then I'm going to turn the hex key until the set screw snugs up against the gib strip and it's pretty firm. I want to back off about a quarter turn and you can just watch the angle of the end of the hex key to gauge that quarter turn. I'm going to repeat that for each one of these. So loosen, loosen the lock nut then we're going to snug it down against the gib and then back off about a quarter turn. And that, what that does is establish sort of a baseline setting and then from there we will uh, fine tune our adjustment. Okay, so I've got each of them now uh, backed off a quarter turn and I've got the lock nuts locked. And it feels pretty smooth right now and uh, that's good. So I'm getting a real smooth movement. And I will say I've done a little bit of tuning on this particular lathe before, so it's probably already uh, a little better adjusted than it was when it came from the factory. And uh, so we've already made good progress. But although it uh, feels okay, it's probably too loose right now to be effective. And by that I mean if I were to grasp this, there's probably some play in there. And let me see if I can illustrate that. I made this little uh, custom tool here just from a scrap of aluminum. It happened to be L-shaped, but uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be L-shaped, but that works out well for what we're doing. But it uh, is drilled to fit uh, in place of the compound, and in fact I use the uh, mounting screws from the compound. I'm going to screw that down, and there's a little uh, cast iron plate down in here, the rotating plate that the uh, normally the compound screws into, and that plate of course is what allows the compound to rotate and I'm going to go ahead and tighten that down now and what uh, the purpose of this is that gives me some leverage on here and with that leverage you can easily see I think let me just uh, zoom in a little closer here that as I wiggle this lever there's quite a lot of play there and if I uh, left the Gibbs in this condition right now if I were trying to make a cut on the lathe, I would almost certainly get some serious chatter and uh, digging into the tool. So this little tool just helps me gauge how much looseness I have. So I'm going to leave that in place. And you may want to make one of these uh, if you want to get into this a little deeper than the average person. And all you need is uh, two 6 millimeter diameter holes here. And I think this one's an 8 millimeter. So it's, uh, just lay it out. And, and I think they're... Uh, 30, 32 millimeters apart, I believe, if I remember correctly. But don't count on that. You may have to measure it with a caliber. All right, well, from here, it's just an iterative process of tightening these three screws up and then backing them off until we get it uh, to what I would consider optimal. So I'm going to tighten this one up a little bit, lock it down again, and then I'm going to test it to make sure it moves freely. So after each adjustment, I want to work the hand wheel and make sure there's no drag uh, that's been introduced. If I start feeling drag, I know I've gone a little bit too far and I need to back it out a little bit. So I'm still okay on that one. So I'm going to loosen the lock nut again. And I'm turning it just maybe a sixteenth of a turn at this point. And it still feels pretty good. Still moving freely. I'm not feeling any significant drag. And uh, at some point you can start to feel that this is pressing up against, you feel a little resistance on the hex key, and you know it's pressing up against the gib strip. And uh, 
So now I'm feeling just a little bit of drag, and I'm going to leave it there. And if I now retest my, uh, do my wobble test, it's a little better than it was. It's still more than it should be and more than I want it to be, but it is better. So now we're going to basically repeat that. We'll pick another uh, one of the three screws and just repeat that process that we did on the middle one. And I like to start on the middle and work my way out to either end. I don't know if it makes much difference, but my theory is if you get the middle right, then the two ends will follow, so to speak. All right, so I'm doing the same thing here. I, I tighten it up just a hair, maybe an eighth of a turn or a sixteenth of a turn. And then I test it to make sure that I'm not getting any significant drag. And I'm okay, so I'm going to go, I want to go a little bit tighter with it. So I loosen it up again. Ooh, let me get that better position there. Tighten it up maybe a sixteenth of a turn. Test it. Still got, you can hear that clicking sound tells me I've still got a significant amount of play in there. And that's one of the benefits of having that little handle, is it gives me an easy way to judge uh, how much play I have. But you can tell that also just from the feel of the hand wheel. If it starts to drag, you know you've got it a little too tight, and you need to back off just a little bit. Okay, it's getting better, but I think we've got a little ways to go still. So, so it can be tedious, and you can easily spend, particularly the first time you do this, don't be surprised if you spend an hour or more playing with this. I've, uh, I think in the early days, I would spend the whole afternoon doing this sometimes before I was comfortable with it. But of course, like anything else, if after you practice it and do it a few times, uh, it gets easier, and you can typically, nowadays, if I need to adjust this, I can get it done in maybe 10 minutes. And once you get it right, uh, it'll be good for quite a long time, usually several months at least, and often up to a year. But that depends a lot on uh, how often, how frequently you use your lathe, and it also depends a lot on how heavy the cuts are that you take and the type of materials. You know, if you're cutting hard, uh, hard materials like steel or stainless steel, it's going to put more a stress on the machine and probably cause these to loosen up faster than they might if you're just working with uh, soft materials like plastics or aluminum. But uh, typically once you get it right, and I think I've got that one pretty close now, you're good for at least a few months. Alright, that's feeling pretty good there. Okay, now you can tell there's much less wobble in there. In fact, you can hardly hear it clicking. Okay, but when I turn the hand wheel, it's still moving very smoothly. So that's what we're trying to. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve here: is a balance between getting it tight enough so that there's a minimal slop or play, uh, but at the same time not so tight that it starts to cause drag and becomes difficult to turn the hand wheel. Okay, I, almost no play at all now. And that's exactly what we want. But it still moves freely. I, I can feel some drag that wasn't there in the beginning, but that's okay. You want a little bit of drag is a good thing. Uh, for one thing, if you didn't have any drag, when you're machining, you would very likely uh, have some vibration that could cause... You might have actually seen this sometimes if you're taking a, a cut where there's some vibration. You might sometimes see the uh, cross-slide hand wheel creeping along from vibration. So having a little bit of drag in there is a good thing, as long as it's not excessive. And this feels pretty good to me right now. So I'm going to do just a little more tweaking on this uh, last one here. And then I'm going to probably declare that done. Here again, uh, you can spend as much time as you want on this. And uh, kind of a personal choice, you know, how much time you think is worth uh, investing. But the more time you spend, obviously, the uh, the better you get to know your machine. And uh, if you plan to do this hobby for a long time, it's worth investing a few hours now uh, that will affect work that you may be doing for several years. Okay, we're done with that one. Let's move on to the compound.